Hi, my name's Dane. I'm a pharmacist at MD Custom RX. Welcome to another installment of um, a Methylene Blue video. But today's video, we're going to highlight a study that came out pretty recently, a randomized control clinical trial. Uh, the reason I picked it is because it is going to highlight oral dosing Methylene Blue uh, with standard of care in like a critical situation. It's going to highlight how Methylene Blue has um, tissue perfusion and how it can aid in overall reduction in inflammation as well as its safety profile, like drug-drug compatibility. So let's hop right in. Finally, to the results. What are the results? Get to the point. I mean, ramble, ramble, ramble. I have your results for you, okay? So a randomized control clinical trial is often coveted as like the gold standard of studies. It's because it has a reduction of bias um, because of the randomization. Uh, but then we also have a control group and the variable group. It's just considered a good study to imply possible relationships uh, between intervention and outcomes, I guess is a good way to think about it. So um, this study uh, of oral methylene blue in patients with COVID-19 that caused what's called acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, uh, it has some insightful results. So this came out, let's see, it was published online August 29th, 2024. The study actually took place between September 2021 and March of 2022. And again, it was an, uh, in an effort to examine the impact of methylene blue on COVID-19 acute respiratory distress syndrome. So there was 312 patients that were assessed for eligibility and uh, 130 of them in total meeting the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And the significant discoveries found in this trial were primarily statistically significant in the improvement of the saturation of peripheral tissues with oxygen, uh, otherwise known as SpO2, uh, usually is for short, or if you're ever looking at labs, you'll see SpO2. Uh, if you ever go to the doctor or for an appointment, a checkup, a lot of times they'll put it on your finger. It's like a little clamp. And often you'll be likely you're, you're between 95% and 100% um, saturation of oxygen in the peripheral tissues. So that was statistically significant um, of the methylene blue treated group versus the control group, as well as a sharper decline in C-reactive protein or CRP levels. Um, let's see, that was over time between the two groups as well. Again, this is going to be a sharper decline in the methylene blue treated group versus none. And then also finally a statistically significant difference in the before and after Apache 2 scores on their day of discharge. So we'll cover what those mean to define these terms uh, as we move forward and kind of go over the results, okay? Another reason we decided to do this video on this controlled clinical trial with methylene blue and COVID was because the flu season is still here or the viral season, let's say, is still here. Um, so it's kind of relevant that way. Also, the results from this study are in line with other studies that um, did methylene blue and COVID-19 kind of coupled together. But those studies were primarily nebulization of methylene blue or uh, intravenous or intravenous, however you'd like to say that. Uh, but this one is oral dosing. So I thought that was unique as much of the audience I'm talking to is likely taking methylene blue orally. And then questions we often get are drug-drug interactions. Um, so this, this study kind of really highlights, you know, or gives a good example of uh, is, is methylene blue uh, safe overall against the majority of drugs? Is it uh, more of like a high-risk drug where it's going to have a lot of interactions? So we get a little bit of light. We shed a little bit of light on that subject with this trial. Um, in order to benefit most, though, from this little summary, let's break down quickly what ARDS is. Um, SpO2, CRP, and Apache 2, and why they matter. So uh, ARDS, also known as acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, is the consequence, uh, or I should say, it's a critical situation where the body is um, failing to push oxygen where it needs to, I guess is a way of saying it. There's three stages of it. Um, depending on what caused it, and it can develop within hours or days. It's characterized by shortness of breath, fast labored breathing, rapid heart rate, can even be like bluish color of fingernails and lips due to low oxygen levels in the blood. Um, why is this bad? <laughs> it can re lead to a lot of uh, potentially fatal things. I mean, there's people that have had collapsed lungs, uh, deep vein thrombosis or DVTs, uh, confusion, which I guess would par for the course, multiple organ failure, 
which would be awful, right? Muscle weakness, scarred lungs, lung fibrosis. Um, some people have gotten even PTSD and, and mental health conditions that have, have appeared because it can be traumatic, right? So um, <clears throat> one thing I want to say, though, Cleveland Clinic, um, according to Cleveland Clinic, COVID-19 caused ARDS. So COVID-19 is the cause of the acute respiratory distress syndrome. That actually has a mortality rate of 50 to 60%. So um, serious condition and any health benefit from the therapy obviously would be noteworthy. So um, that is ARDS. So SpO2, again, stands for saturation of peripheral oxygen, which mes measures the percentage of oxygen saturation hemoglobin in the blood. Uh, healthy le levels are generally between 95% and 100%. So when you test it, right, you, uh, you usually want to be between 95 and 100%. Age comes into play a little bit. Um, typically, people that are a little bit older are going to have um, lower levels of that peripheral oxygen saturation. So 98%, 97% uh, would not be considered abnormal, would still be considered healthy. So that comes into play a little bit here. Um, damage can uh, occur, though, when your, your pulse oximetry or SpO2 um, falls for an extended period of time, basically under 90%. That could, would require immediate medical attention just to make sure nothing's going too far awry. We would want to stop that, reverse it as soon as we can. Um, moving on. So the next definition I want to get on here because it's a biomarker from the study is uh, C-reactive protein. So C-reactive protein is a biomarker. Uh, it's used along with some others to measure the severity of injury being done to the body via inflammation. Um, cell damage and tissue injury. Sorry, I'm using my right hand to move my mouse. I have my coffee too, so sorry about that. Um, so the common range for CRP levels is 0 0.3 milligrams per deciliter to about one milligram per deciliter. And in some cases of acute injury or like even, uh, so let's say a bacterial infection can really cause CRP levels to shoot up. It's even been documented up to a thousand fold. Um, but that's just showing it's a, a good kind of marker of telling if the body's kind of getting worse or if it's, it's circling back uh, towards the, the healthy state. And then lastly is our Apache 2 score. Our Apache 2 score uh, is a quantitative way to measure a person's ICU mortality risk. So intensive care unit mortality risk. They try to quantify as much as they can, right, uh, just for statistical information. And then as well as to try to see trends and know what to do next. You know, any information we can gather is good in the situation that's potentially dire. So the lower the Apache 2 score, the less likely you are to perish while in the ICU. Not to be so morbid, um, but I thought that would, you know, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what it is. So, um, yes, moving on. So in the methylene blue treatment group... They were given oral dosing of one milligram per kilogram every eight hours for the first two days, followed by one milligram per kilogram every 12 hours. Let's see, for the next five days of the 66 individuals in the methylene blue group, three of them did not finish the study due to gastrointestinal adverse effects, which uh, two of them experienced nausea and, and one of them had diarrhea. No other side effects, though, were noted. Um, I will state that these patients were also given the usual treatment dose associated with ARDS currently uh, for that hospital, being combinations of remdesivir, corticosteroids, anticoagulants, and antibiotics. The antibiotics were if they had signs of bacterial infection in their CT scans. Uh, the reason I'm highlighting this in particular is because methylene blue, in my opinion, should be seen as an adjunct to most therapies. It's a helpful addition. It also highlights its over overall compatibility with most medicines being used. Uh, furthermore, it's highlighting a relatively mundane side effect profile, and unsurprisingly, the side effects were standard, being nausea and diarrhea. These are often liability side effects put on most medication lists, though if you'd like more information on methylene blue in context of your GI, I do have a video on that as well. I think on this channel here, of course, um, it's just literally methylene blue and the GI. Finally, to the results. What are the results? Get to the point. I mean, ramble, ramble, ramble. I have your results for you, okay? The results of this clinical controlled trial, randomized. Um, let's see here. In the methylene blue treatment group, the oxygen saturation 
the SpO2 levels on day zero, so like before everything started, was 78.31, a meager 78.31%. That is that is low. This is why they're in ICU. Um, but by day three, we're at 80.84%, and then by day five, we're at 84.73%, whereas the control group, uh, day zero started higher than the methylene blue group at 80.21%, and then by day five, they went up to 82.05%. So these results showed not only that the methylene blue group started at a lower oxygen saturation, and this is before any methylene blue was introduced, but within five days, just five days, they surpassed the control group, raising oxygen saturation by 6% within five days, as opposed to the 1.8% in the control group. I mean, that is, that's a staggering difference um, just by adding oral methylene blue. Um, these results could be explained potentially by the known benefits and mechanisms that Methylene Blue utilizes. Uh, this, this channel now has many videos on the different mechanisms that Methylene Blue is ut utilizing. But it al also may point at, and I don't mean to bamboozle anybody, but the word synergistic. It may point at a synergistic effect that it may have with other medicines potentially. This would be a daunting task to prove quantitatively, but it's still worth considering. Our bodies are not separate compartments, rather we're a bunch of contingencies, right? So there could be a deeper pharmacologic dynamic at play here. Um, moving on, there's your ramble, there's another ramble. Um, the results for the CRP levels, again, C-reactive protein, measuring inflammation, normal range 0 0.3 to 1 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, we're going to start with the control group this time. They had a starting score of 9.26 and were discharged... Oh, that is incorrect. I'm sorry. That's the Apache 2 score. Moving back to the CRP levels. Do, 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 do. Going with the control group again here. Uh, they had a baseline. This makes way more sense. Uh, they would have been pretty healthy if their CRP was uh, under 10 already. <laughs> um, the control group went from a baseline of 100.18 to day 5 of 21.86 milligrams per deciliter. This is considerable, and it's awesome to hear. That means that the standard of care that they're using in that hospital actually was, was working, right? Bringing everything down, uh, and that they might have been treated appropriately. Uh, the methylene group, blue group at baseline was, again, slightly worse. Uh, they were at 103.14, and by day five, they were down to 15.13. Um, again, this is somewhat not surprising. Uh, it's a way of verifying that the methylene blue group is recovering quicker. So it's just a biomarker showing the efficacy of methylene blue, even orally, as an adjunct to already standards of care when it's multiple drugs put on someone for treatment too, right? When you start layering drugs up, you get uh, pharma pharmacologic uh, levels at play and you need to make sure you're not having any inter interactions. That's always a concern. So it's, it's really nice to see that we, one, can take methylene blue orally. Two, we can take it on top of a ton of treatments. Three, we can take it um, even in high risk or vulnerable states and it's still going to be helpful. So lastly, we have the Apache 2 scores. Um, again, this was a quantitative way to measure mortality risk. The lower the score, the less likely you are to pass or, or die in ICU. Um, the control group started with a score of 9.26 and were discharged with a score of 8.16, whereas the methylene blue score started at 9.33, again, slightly higher in line with the other um, results here too, which were all kind of worse than the methylene blue to start. And we're discharged with uh, 5.94. This was a statistically significant reduction. So uh, that's really it. Um, it just goes without saying. It's clean. It was a randomized control clinical trial. We had extremely vulnerable patients in a critical state uh, suffering from acute respiratory distress syndrome, which can be hard to manage, has a high mortality rate. Um, they were given the standard of care both without methylene blue, with methylene blue, methylene blue orally, even as an adjunct, only at one milligram per kilogram, although it was dosed uh, every eight hours in the beginning and then every 12 hours for the last few days, um, greatly enhanced the recovery profile of the majority of patients to a statistically significant degree. So just thought I'd share that with you. Uh, hopefully it sheds a little bit more light on methylene blue. We're all kind of learning together as data comes out on methylene blue and um, it just is consistently promising. So it's, it's nice. So thanks for bearing with me. If you've made it this long, I'm sure we'll have another video. I've wanted to do methylene blue and uh, cancers and see if there's utility there. 
I think there might be. I haven't gotten a ton of research done on it yet, but I have a feeling that video is to come. So if you guys have questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. We get to them when we can. Uh, we do read them all. Um, some are very entertaining. Some are very helpful. Some are just good quality questions, and we try to answer as much as we can. So thank you for your time. Take care.